Okay, welcome everybody. Today we have Tim Murphy from the Quad City Audubon Society with us. Um, I'm going to let him go ahead and take it away. Super. All right. Uh, thank you, Celeste. Um, yes, my name is Tim Murphy. I'm with the Quad City Audubon Society, and I've been with the Quad City Audubon Society for quite a while. Um, I'm a retired probation officer. I do have a bachelor's degree in biology, but uh, at some point in my life, I decided I need to make biology my hobby, not my, my way of making a living. So when I got to town, I joined the Audubon Society and began learning about birds. I really didn't know too much about identifying birds till I hit there. So um, I, it's kind of like a recommendation if you guys would want to do so is to look into coming to a meeting or a field trip. Uh, we have a web page and you can get our information there. And I'll talk about some upcoming field trips at the end of the program uh, regarding waterfowl as well. Um, so at any rate, <clears throat> the subject tonight is waterfowl. I call it our ducks, geese, and swans. These are all birds that can be found in our area. Um, it won't be all the birds on this picture necessarily, but uh, most of them. Um, but we'll both, mostly what I'll be doing is just talking about how to identify them, how to tell them one duck from the other. I uh, will give a little bit of natural history, but not tons. Um, and that kind of fits with uh, Audubon people. We're birders. Our first goal is to learn how to identify the birds we see by sight and call. And as we become more educated, then we get more into the environmental and ecological parameters of the species and behaviors and things. But at any rate, our first mission is just to know what we're looking at. So that's what we'll kind of focus on today. Uh, so when I was asked to do a program, I kind of thought, well, what is appropriate? And waterfowl seems appropriate because this is spring and waterfowl is on the move. And they're on the move because through our area, because we have this great place called the Mississippi River. And in the green on this slide, you can see the Mississippi River Flyway and the ducks are coming up the flyway right now. Um, some have been wintering here all year and will migrate all the way up into the Arctic and to Alaska and to the Hudson Bay area. Um, <clears throat> some, are, some are just getting in here and will keep on going. And of course, some will breed in this area, but most ducks go much farther north than us, or most waterfowl, I should say. Um, and where are they headed? A great many are headed for the North American duck factory, this prairie pothole region, which extends from just under Alaska all the way through uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta and I think that's on, I can't remember, Ontario, not, not quite, into the Dakotas, even all the way down into Iowa, though uh, a lot of this prairie pothole region in Iowa has been uh, converted to cropland. I know several years ago I was through that area though and we were shown places where they broke the tiles in the fields, the fields flood and the habitat was coming back. I mean, the seed, the seed source was still there for the wetland plants. And it was pretty, it can be, it could be in a really amazing place for waterfowl, but corn and soybeans are king in the Midwest. So what makes the Mississippi River kind of important? Well, part of it is it's got duck food. And we don't think too much about it, I don't believe, but the river bottom is, is in part full of food. I mean, in many places. Uh, and some of them are these fingernail clams, uh, larvae such as the caddisfly larvae. We know them as those uh, insects, I guess we would probably consider noxious, the shad flies. And then uh, mayfly larvae as well, plus other worms and leeches and other other mollusks and, and and of course the ducks eat a lot of vegetation as well including grains from fallow fields and and uh, seeds from smart weed and those kinds of things it's not just these but these are really important food sources for many of our ducks and that's one reason why they're on the river and of course like many things there you were to sample the river bottom 20 years ago, you'd find a lot more of these than you do now. But that's kind of the way our environment goes. Um, 
duck ID can seem intimidating at times. I mean, when you, if you approach ducks, you're hopeful that they'll stay seated and you can watch them and kind of catch them. But this is what duck hunters might see. It's just a bunch of ducks on the wing. But, you know, with a little practice, you could start pulling individual species out of here. It's not, it's not as intimidating as it might think. Um, so I'm going to show a bunch of slides of ducks. Uh, they are not my slides. I didn't take them. They're basically from the internet. Most of them are from the Cornell website. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, I can't remember the name of it. But there you have it. But anyway, it's a Cornell website. I use it a lot. It gives you a nice overview, beginner's overview of every species that they put up there. And they have all the species in, the, in North America. So it's a really good place. All about birds, I believe, is what you'll see if you Google an individual bird. So <clears throat> moving along, we'll also talk about some of the geese. And uh, this, are, this is pretty much all Canada geese and snow geese. And as you can see, sometimes they're in really huge numbers. So we'll start out though with swans. There's three North American swans that come through the area. And uh, the first one I'm gonna mention is the tundra swan. The tundra swan winters way or breeds way up into, as it might say, the tundra, Arctic circle area. And uh, they're basically all swans or vegetation eaters for the most part, they eat a lot of roots and root stalks and um, leaves and things. <clears throat> they do get some protein as they eat those those materials. The tundra swans can be pretty easy to die to identify if you see the little yellow eye patch. Unfortunately, I don't recall ever seeing the little yellow eye patch. It's not present in a lot of birds. This is what I'm used to seeing as this swan. Um, now, when you talk to people, they'll say this long straight neck is kind of diagnostic. The trumpeter swan, which could one could confuse it with, has a longer neck and a little more curvy. What I shoot for though, and hopefully it's relatively dependable, but it's hard, is that I look at the way this black bill runs to the eye. It kind of terminates at the front point of the eye. And, and that, so I might talk a little bit about what I use. I use binoculars, I mean, and I use 10 power binoculars, which are pretty strong, but we also use spotting scopes, which can zoom out to 60 power for ducks that are in the middle of the channel and those sorts of things. But at any rate, uh, a really good birder will just be able to look at the general shape of the bird and tell you tundra versus trumpeter, but I have to go for kind of this field marking. And they also talk about the face being relatively straight across in a tundra swan and more in a V in a trumpeter. So here's the trumpeter. The bent neck is kind of diagnostic. This red grin is diagnostic, but again, I only see this. I never see this guy with the red grin in the upper left. Can you? Can people see my cursor? Can you see my cursor, Celeste? Super. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> but what you do see is it appears that this black mask, if you will, the bill, seems to encompass the eye. It doesn't stop at the point. So when I'm on a bird, that's what I go for first. And this is supposed to be a deeper V in the forehead than in the tundra swan. So again, trumpeter swans um, nest in the Arctic and the Arctic Circle and those sorts of places, but they were also native to the lower 48. They were native to Iowa. There were a lot of some trumpeter swans in Iowa. They were hunted out. Uh, at one point, it was thought to be as few as 70 trumpeter swan, trumpeter swans in North America in the, in the 30s or so. Uh, there were probably breeding populations in Northern Canada, but basically a decimated species. Uh, <clears throat> conservation efforts have been increasing uh, for quite a few years now and the trumpeter swans are coming back. I mean, the trumpeter swans are back. They are breeding in again in Iowa. Uh, Goose Lake has them, I know. I remember visiting a breeder up in that area who had them on his private uh, property. <clears throat> and so now trumpeter swans are kind of common. If you see a swan with the collar, it's almost always a trumpeter swan. 
<clears throat> because those are ones that are still being tracked and are coming off the breeding populations. But they're breeding wild now. So it's kind of like a big success story. Well, it is a big success story. Oh, no, no, this, do you guys have the box of people over my, over my picture? Or no, my, I have a box of you guys over my, over my swan picture here. Um, over the head. I am not seeing the box of people, I think. Okay, that's... you don't see the box. Cool, no. so you see the swan. Yeah. And you see the great big red face that I don't see, the great big orange bill. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't see the orange bill because I got you guys. I have a box of people here. Uh, you should be able to change that if you hit your view. Um, Let me. I bet I can minimize it. There we go. Perfect. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, there's my orange-faced mute swan. This is the European swan, the ugly duckling swan. Um, they now breed in the wild in the North America. They're bigger than, I mean, any, with the orange bill, that's the mute swan. They also are very stocky. They eat a ton. They can eat like eight pounds of vegetative material a day. And in particular, the East Coast, they're considered to be quite the nuisance because they're just, you know, eating all the habitats, eating all the pond bottom stuff and those sorts of things. So they're kind of becoming a problem. But we had mute, mute swans on the, in Lock of Dam 13 just a few few weeks ago, but it was super cold. Oh, everyone knows the Canada goose, probably one of the most common birds in North America now. Uh, certainly on our Christmas counts and spring counts, it's one of the top sellers, if you will. Uh, I don't think we need to talk too much about identification. I would say that, again, this is a bird that was really decimated as far as numbers go. Um, and it was, it seems like it was in the 60s that people were ecstatic to find geese back in, in their yards and things because they're in the strip mine ponds because they just hadn't been seen. Uh, but the population has exploded. What's kind of interesting is that there's two populations. There's a migratory population and that population really hasn't grown. And that's the one that goes from Canada down to the Gulf of Mexico and back, <clears throat> or even to Southern Illinois, a lot of them. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> you have a resident population, which is what we have on our golf courses and our backyard ponds and our, and probably most of our strip mines, the Mississippi River along Ben Butterworth Parkway. And those populations are the populations that just exploded. They have a longer life, they have bigger clutches and as most of us know, they can be considered quite the nuisance. And there's a lot of grass and the habitat, we've just, we've just altered our habitats so much to, to grasses that these geese eat that they've, they're gaining the upper hand. You know, a golf course is a great place for a goose. Um, <clears throat> this is a little, little goose that uh, is kind of increasing in numbers, or at least it's increasing in numbers around here. I think it migrated, migrated normally more in the Western flyaways, but it's kind of sneaking over to the east. It's called the cackling goose. Um, it looks very much like the Canada goose. The thing I focus on is its size is appreciably smaller, but if it's just floating by itself, you might think, oh, I don't know about that. But, but <clears throat> it uh, has a very, stubby bill. That's what you kind of cue on. Its bill is really small even for its head. It also may have a white collar. This picture doesn't show a white collar, but it may have a white collar in here or a necklace. And here's a Canada goose in the lower right and the cackling in the upper left. And again, you can see how the bill is stubby and small in comparison. It's considered brown in color as opposed to gray. And so that's cackling versus Canada goose. There's not tons of them around, but they can be found. And if you're trying to get as many species as possible on your weekend trip, it's nice to find a cackling goose. Snow geese. Snow geese have been Western United States for many, many years in big numbers. They are a goose that's increasing by leaps and bounds in numbers, so much so that it's 
has had a tendency to exhaust its forage material in the Arctic where it breeds. There's two color forms, the white and the blue. It's a little bit hard to see, but it has a large grin in its bill, which is diagnostic. Pink bill, orange legs. I mean, really this, they don't look too much like anything but themselves. So it's fairly hard to confuse them with other things, but they've, their migratory patterns has really drifted east over the past few decades, I would guess, a couple decades. And now it's not super uncommon to just see thousands of these geese in a field feeding in grain or, um, I know I see them at <clears throat> uh, on the Illinois River at Emaquan in uh, big numbers as well. A look-alike kind of is the Ross's goose. This also is a Western goose that west, migrates more to the west, but I put it in here because this spring I found, a, or this spring, this fall, I found a Ross's goose at Nahant. Uh, so, and they are here. I know they've been found at Cone Marsh as well. Um, it's kind of like the cackling goose. It has a really small uh, bill, small stubby bill. It's also appreciably smaller than the snow goose. When I saw it at Nahant, I said, and I'm not familiar with Ross's goose, I don't know if I've even ever seen one before, but I said, that's Ross's goose. It's tiny compared comparatively. And sure it was. So here's a picture of Ross's goose to the left, stubby bill, small size, much larger um, <clears throat> snow goose. You can see the grin is appreciable. There's no real grin in these. And of course the Canada's below them. Uh, the last goose. These goose are also seem to be coming more and more to the east from the west. Um, the greater white fronted goose. Um, it's a big goose. Orange bill, orange legs, barred flanks, white forehead. That's pretty diagnostic as well, the white forehead. Um, I know that during the Christmas count, people were reporting large numbers of these down by down by Keysburg. Again, all these goose basically breed in the Arctic Circle in the tundra and up in Alaska, northern Canada for the most part. Um, <clears throat> so, but it could be confused with this guy, the domesticated goose. Now, if you watch geese a little bit, you can kind of tell right away because these domesticated geese are fat. I mean, they're just bigger and stockier and blockier than a wild goose. But at first glance, you would say, oh, that's this greater white fronted. I mean, they kind of look alike, but no white face shield. I mean, they have orange bills and orange legs, but no white face shield. And they're much, and they're much stockier. <clears throat> So here they are together. The gray leg in the bottom, or gray leg, the white fronted in the bottom with the white face shield and the um, gray leg at the top without a face shield. And the head is bigger. The bill is much more stout. Sometimes they'll have a knobby protuberance on the bill. And so their, their profile doesn't really look the same. So hopefully, I mean, they can confuse you. These guys are usually more uh, contrasty too. These are lighter, tend to be lighter. So that helps you out a little bit. All right. Okay, we're leaving geese. We're into ducks. There's two major divisions, if you will, in ducks. And the first one are the puddle ducks. Puddle ducks tend to be in shallow water. They can dive, but they don't often dive. Oftentimes they'll feed by tipping. Of course, they'll also feed just by swishing their bill in the water or putting their bill down without tipping and getting to the bottom or running. You know, there's lots of different feeding strategies, but they, but diving ducks do not tip like this, um, <clears throat> or at least not very frequently. So puddle ducks are like the, the main division of ducks. And the first one we'll talk about are the wood ducks. And wood ducks are 
uh, Illinois and Iowa breeders. I mean, they breed in this area. They love nesting cavities. Back in the 70s, 60s and 70s, wood ducks had been, their populations were really low. People were very concerned about wood ducks. And it was largely brought about by lack of nesting cavities. And so folks started building wood duck houses by like just by crazy. And lo and behold, the wood duck population has responded to that. So, you know, we've done a few good things. It's pretty easy to tell the uh, male wood duck. I mean, it's got this massive crest, if you will. I call it a helmet. Um, and it has, you know, the breeding plumage, they just have tons of coloration. Now, I don't think there's hardly any trouble with most of us learning male ducks in breeding plumage, but the females are a whole different story. So we'll, I'm not saying we'll focus on females, but those are, those are where you'll have most of your trouble. The wood duck female though, really cooperates with this big, big white eye ring or patch around the eye. I mean, it's, it can be seen from a long way away and it's really, really noticeable. They also, when they take, when you flush a female wood duck, it calls almost universally, weep, 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 as it takes off. So <clears throat> even if you don't see it, you'll, you can hear it. <clears throat> and so these guys uh, inhabit a lot of really shallow waters where nesting cavities are close and they're pretty common in the area. A little bit shy, so they're kind of hard to see. Tend to hang out by the shoreline. Um, but many people would say it's the king of the ducks as far as beauty, the male breeding plumage wood duck. And it's kind of hard to argue with that. I mean, and the other thing that's kind of interesting is birds see color differently than we do. Not only do they see all this brightness, but this brightness to a bird is a lot brighter to them than it is to us. They see light in a different, in different frequencies. So this red eye is probably just blazing and this orange is blazing. And even the white is likely just a huge white streak that people, then they probably can even tell individuals apart by the way they're marked. Uh, the ubiquitous mallard. I guess we all are familiar with mallards. The most common North American duck. They can breed here. Many of them breed north. They're the duck that's the most hunted. Um, they're good eating. They're large, so you have a lot of meat. Again, <clears throat> they tame down pretty well, so they can be found around ponds and in cities and towns and things. And of course, we feed them bread, which we shouldn't. Um, green head, solid yellow bill in the male, white side. Uh, the female, obviously much more nondescript. Oftentimes you'll see the blue speculum though, so that's helpful. And it has an orange bill with the center black. And I, that's really the only duck that has an orange bill with the center black. So you get this nondescript, nondescript female, look for the bill and if it has that, then you've got a mallard. So that's kind of helpful. Closely related to the mallard is an American black duck. These guys come, they migrate through later than the mallards or one of the latter, later ducks to come through. People nickname them red legs because they're red legs. Here's the male. This is considered a tan face, uh, <clears throat> a yellow bill like the mallard male. The females, instead of the orange bill though, they're much more, they're not as dark Males have the blue speculum, the females do not, but they have the yellow bill like the male does. So versus female mallard, yellow bill versus that one with the black patch, that kind of helps you out. Plus you won't see the blue speculum in the female black duck, but you could in the male. Uh, here's a female mallard just for a little bit of comparison. I mean, bill is the key and the blue, but the speculum, you can see that in the female, like you do in the male black duck, but the coloration is different and the bill is different. So you have a, once you see them, you know them. I remember the first time I saw a black duck, I said black duck. I mean, I just, you just kind of know after a while. Ah, one of my favorites is the gadwall. Gadwall seems to be um, 
increasing in uh, the United States. The black duck, by the way, is not. Black ducks are hybridizing with mallards, and that's taken down the black ducks, it seems. But anyway, the cadwalls seem to be increasing. They're kind of a medium-sized duck. Um, you're supposed to notice the puffy head. Uh, it doesn't show so much in the female, but it has a puffy head. The male has a gray body with dark, very dark black tail feathers. It, it looks, actually it looks, I don't think this picture does it justice. It looks kind of, it looks elegant and nice light. Uh, the female is a little hard to tell apart from the mallard. Again though, here's the bill. We have a, we have the black on top, but it doesn't go over to the sides. It's an orange stripe going down. So that's helpful. You can oftentimes see the white speculum as well in the uh, in the wings of the, the uh, resting or sitting female gadwall. The other thing that does help is a lot of times these ducks are paired up. So <clears throat> once you find the male, the, the duck next to it is probably its female. Not always, but probably. <clears throat> um, gadwalls uh, don't nest next to the water, but they usually nest in dry, brushy areas. And these guys are ducks in the duck factory that we talked about, the Dakotas and Canadas and those sorts of areas. They're not necessarily Arctic breeders like the geese. All right, <clears throat> blue wing teal. Um, these guys are come down early uh, in, in uh, fall. I think teal season is the first duck season that opens and that's usually around the 1st of September. The males are very distinctive. White crescents behind the bill, white patch on the rump, but the females are like, ooh, that is really nondescript. And I don't have a really super good way of telling you that, except, you know, they have a dark, solid dark bill. Uh, they are nondescript. I mean, no speculum or those sorts of things. They have a little, little white behind the bill. Um, they're a smaller duck. So you, 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 it's, diff, it's a bit tricky, but they can be identified. It's not impossible. Of course, if they take off, it's really nice because those blue, they're called blue wing teal for a reason. They have patches. They have the blue patches and they're noticeable. Uh, the female below and the male above, I mean, that's a strike. To me, that's, that's a striking bird. And here they are again in flight. The female in the rear, if you will, the male here in the middle. The male shows the green in the right angle as well. <clears throat> and to me, you know, there you have this, you know, plain nondescript duck until they take off. And then, then you got blue patches everywhere. Kind of nice. Uh, green wing teals, smaller than the blue wings. These guys come through really late in fall. They're like one of the last uh, puddle ducks to come through, it seems to me. Well, they are one of the last. I mean, it doesn't seem to me that's a fact. Uh, <clears throat> kind of easy to tell with the male again. Uh, you know, kind of russet head, green stripe, sometimes easily seen, sometimes not so easily seen. Um, kind of a tan. This looks white, but I say more tan. But this stripe, this stripe through here is seen from a long way away. And it's very diagnostic for me. I see this before I notice the head. And so green wing teal has that. Again, the female, <laughs> not, not uh, very, very nondescript and small. You may or may not see the green speculum. So again, it's like a size thing on this one. If you have two ducks the same size, you got this male and this female, you got the green winged teal. And again, they come through late. So there's <clears throat> oftentimes no other puddle ducks even really around, maybe some Northern shovelers. Widgeons, or also called the bald pate. There's a lot of, by the way, there's a lot of green, green winged teal in the United States and North America. They're like the second most hunted bird in North America. The American widgeon, I don't, see as many of these probably as the other ducks, but they are certainly, again, they migrate through. They winter, I've seen them and I've been in Texas and seen them wintering in Texas and they they breed in the prairie pothole region. Um, also called bald pate because of their white stripe on the male, green head. 
white speculum, white butt, uh, blue bill with a black nail. But all, both male and female, have this dark eye. And the dark eye is noticeable. More than just noticeable, I'd say it's really diagnostic. So you can see that from a long way away. You can, you can identify widgeon by eye alone. Here's widgeons in flight. Look at that eye down there. I mean, that's that's that is absolutely dramatic. And there's what's this? Our gadwall, gray sides, black butt, little white speculum. So gadwall and widgeons. <clears throat> ah, some people consider this like the regal duck of the puddle ducks, the northern pintail. It is a regal looking duck. I mean, it has this deep chocolate head, white striped, white neck, grayish body, tan, vanilla, spot, long tail. The female has a long tail, sloping head, which is, you know, you get, you start noticing profiles and overall things when you look at these ducks enough and the sloping head, dark bills, pintails come through early. Um, they want to be on the nesting ground, on the breeding grounds, again, the prey pothole region quickly. As soon as the ice is gone, they're ready to start nesting. Um, so they come through pretty early in the fall as well. Just, they're a larger, larger duck as well, but just magnificent. Uh, I think the last puddle duck is this one, the shoveler. They're kind of funky looking ducks, massive bills. The male has a green mallard-like head, unmistakable flank though, with the rust, huge russet patch and the white feathering around. Um, the female is unmistakable once you get used to looking for this big, big bill. Um, I mean, other ducks have big bills, but nothing like these. These guys feed by sweeping these bills back and forth through the water and feeling or crustaceans and amphipods and small critters that way and seeds and stuff. <clears throat> Other than that, the female is very nondescript, but the big bill is pretty, pretty helpful. Northern shovelers seem to come through late, late spring, later than most puddle ducks, late spring and come through late fall as well. Okay, here's our picture of ducks. Can we identify ducks now that we've had our little primer, if you will. Well, let's see. Right in the middle, blue wing teal. Look at that patch. There's a blue wing teal. Here's a widgeon, dark eye of the widgeon. We also have the, the uh, brown stripe. But here's that russet, russet patch of the northern shoveler and the great big bill and the green head. So widgeons, widgeons, let's call those dark eyes. Oh, another blue wing teal, the crescent in front. Oh, widget and bald pate. We can see again the dark eye. We can even get a little bit of the, the white patch. Pintail. There we go. Chocolate head. Neck. Long. All up here are many pintails flying. Most pintails and widgets flying. This is largely a mixed flock of pintails and widgets with um, some shovelers and some blue winged teal. And is there anything else in here? Don't think so, but I'm not going to count them out. So anyway, you know, through the primer, we just, we can identify even in this mass, you know, different ducks by different markings. I mean, the teal from not only the crescent in the male, but the blue stripe on the wings, the blue patch on the wings. So I think that's kind of neat. Big shoveler here. All right, we're rolling into the diving ducks now. And we're about, we're over half done. So if you're getting a little bit bored, you need to stretch or something. Well, I don't know how you do that, but we're, I'm just letting you know that we're, we're rolling through. Okay, canvas back. Diving ducks. These are guys that dive to the bottom of the river. Um, many of them are found in pretty deep waters. Many times you'll see these ducks in the channel not so much on the sides um, and the coast, they're in the bays, they'll winter in the bays of Texas and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, it will be on 
on bigger bodies of water as well that are and they'll overwinter on the river. I mean, we had canvas backs just a few weeks ago by Lock and Dam 13. Red head, huge sloping bill. That's the first thing, huge sloping bill. So the female looks very nondescript, but it has the huge sloping bill. White throughout the back, black, black. Um, really, many people kind of consider the canvas back a king of duck. Tends to be a vegetarian. Uh, one of its favorite foods is uh, wild celery, which is probably in decline over much of its habitat, but it really likes that. Uh, <clears throat> similar in coloration, at least, to the canvas back is the redhead. Uh, redhead, uh, but it's not sloping at all like the uh, canvas back. Gray, white here. This is, this is a little grayer than I like to think of it, white here, but gray on top more. Black, black like the canvas back, but truthfully their profiles are much different. And I kind of struggled a couple weeks ago because this was this canvas back was sleeping and all I had was black, white, and black. But but anyway, if it's heads up, it's simple. Uh, blue bill, white, black nail. <clears throat> Again, the female is very, very nondescript, uh, but there's not much that is even in female diving ducks, it's just nondescript. So, I mean, that's kind of helpful. That buffy color is kind of helpful. Um, redheads are duck, are brood parasites. They are the king of ducks that lay their eggs in other ducks' nests. Not saying they don't raise their own, but they do that fairly frequently. <clears throat> Daffy duck, maybe? I keep thinking that Daffy duck was a ring neck duck. Um, here we have a purplish, very domed head. Uh, the ring, I don't know, I don't know why it's ring neck duck, but ring on the bill, by the head, ring at the tip, black nail, uh, female, this white crescent, not, and a white eye ring. So that kind of helps you that, kind of nondescript, but it does have a darker back than body. But what I look at, again, for me, this white stripe through the center is what I see first from a distance. Uh, ring neck duck is very distinctive with that. Uh, they're divers, they kind of jump before they go in the water. They kind of jump up and then go down. Um, these guys could be, these guys all beyond the Mississippi River and they like deep water, but they also uh, don't mind shallow ponds as well. So if you're in shallow water and you have a diving duck, the chances are good it could be a ring neck. I didn't put up coots. Coots are in shallow water too and they dive. Um, but, oh, well, we can't have everything today. Uh, lesser scop, also called bluebills. Um, <clears throat> so for me, lesser scop are seen by the males by this white patch. This is, this is a great photograph, but from a distance, this is most of the time much more white, surrounded by dark, dark. Uh, bluebill. A uh, black tip on the nail, a domed head, not as much as the uh, ring neck duck, but still a domed head, domed head on the female. Uh, again, very nondescript and uniform for the most part. This white face, though, behind the bill is, is pretty helpful in general. Uh, there is a greater scop, which I didn't put up a picture. 95% of the ducks through here are lessers. Greater scops tend to be on the East Coast more, uh, and they tend to be in big water. They have bigger, um, they have a slightly bigger body. Their heads are rounded, not domed. They're very, they can be very challenging to tell apart from lessers. Uh, it's not considered shameful to say, I don't know if, you're con if you don't know, but around here, it's almost always lesser. I mean, huge, huge numbers of lessers compared to graders. Uh, <clears throat> common golden eyes. So you have a duck with an all white flanks through the chest and a big white circle behind the bill, common golden eye. They're only here in the winter. <clears throat> they nest in the Arctic, or not the Arctic so much, they nest in, uh, in timber and in, in beaver ponds and streams and forests. They are cavity nesters, uh, cavities of pileated woodpecker the male with the white patch, 
uh, <clears throat> black and white, essentially, the female with the brown hat. Um, they are here throughout the winter, sometimes maybe the most common duck on the on the river in wintertime. And here's our raft of golden eyes. I will point out that we have a brown headed golden eye with a white patch. That's not the female, that's simply a male that's not yet in breeding plumage. And here's the females back here without the white patch and the brown head, and then the males with the breeding plumage. Fairly closely related to the golden eye, I would suppose, is the buffle head. Uh, again, they nest in the Canada in the timber, uh, similar to the uh, golden eyes, but they use, uh, and they're cavity nesters, but they use cavities that have been excavated by flickers. So these cavities are smaller, the buffle head are smaller, they can use the cavities for the flickers and the, the larger ducks like the um, golden eye can't fit in there. So they kind of, they avoid their competition that way. Uh, all white front and flank, a smallish duck. There's no other duck that has a patch of feathers on the back of its head that the male buffalo had. And <clears throat> there's no real duck that has this big uh, horizontal cheek patch either than the female buffalo head. So um, they're fairly easy to tell apart. They're here through the winter, probably lesser than the golden eyes, but they're, they should be back now. They're coming back today at Ben Butterworth Parkway, I only saw golden eyes. I, I just dropped down there for just seconds. I mean, it wasn't there very long, but um, but these guys will be coming through soon. I mean, this is this is the time. Uh, March is the time for uh, the wintering ducks to leave and the southern ducks to come in and go up. They like to get on their breeding grounds, this pot, you know, and find the good spots. Uh, if you're a competitive male to find a good spot so you can attract the mate if you haven't pa paired up before you left. <clears throat> so, uh, mergansers. These are both male mergansers. Sorry to change things up on you a little bit, but uh, common merganser, a common, relatively common winter bird here in the middle of the channels. Mergansers are fish eaters. They have a serrated bill kind of narrow and thin, great divers, and they can sink too. They don't just dive, they can sink. Uh, but at any rate, I call these guys the Durox for some reason, I'm not sure, because they are so big. They're just big, huge white flanks, huge white neck, dark back. Sometimes they seem dark on front and back. Um, <clears throat> as opposed to the red breast of Berganser, which has a red chest, and obviously it's not white throughout the flank. It has a lot of black and white interspersed, not the sleek head of the common merganser either. So they're pretty easy to tell apart, but the females give me fits. Here's the female common merganser. Um, you're supposed to look for the demarcation between red of its neck and white on its neck, as opposed to this sliding up this more gradual white throughout the neck, as these two show. You're also supposed to look for this um, white patch on by its bill, as opposed to this more model uh, patch. It's not as discreet. This guy is supposed to have a less wild hairdo than this guy, but here's one that just came up. So obviously its hairdo is not nearly as wild because it slipped back. Um, I don't think that body color is very helpful, though. I mean, they show different colors, but this is pretty gray. It's pretty gray. Uh, so to me, I, I can spend a fair amount of time looking at female mergansers parsing out what I have. <clears throat> Fortunately, it's not that way with hoodeds. Um, there's not much cuter than a male hooded, well, really both, male and female and a uh, hooded merganser, this uh, really brown, chocolate brown almost uh, flank, uh, buttressed by the black back, really white hood, may be up, may not be up. Uh, the female's always showing this crest, 
they're small, they're round, there's, they're, they're really, there's nothing that looks too much like them. I mean, you might confuse them with a the buffle head, but because they both have patches in the back, but still at all. <clears throat> These guys breed here, uh, right in our area. They're cavity nesters, similar to wood ducks. They could use wood duck boxes as well, though they're smaller when normally would use a smaller cavity. Um, they're not super common to find, but I mean, they're not here in big numbers, but they're fairly, I mean, if you go out all day, the chances are good that you'll find a uh, hooded merganser somewhere. Okay, diving duck, ruddy duck. Um, 647, we're doing really well, so we're getting close. Um, <clears throat> ruddy duck is red, huge horizontal white cheek patch, both male and female, a very round duck. This guy looks like a pot to me. Uh, the male has a, both have a stiff, relatively large tail. The male tends to hold theirs up straight in the air and the head's kind of straight in the air. And, and it looks like a teapot to me. They look like teapots. Uh, blue bill. Um, and <clears throat> these guys are, are decent divers. They're not really very good at getting away though in the by air. If they're gonna escape a predator, they're going underwater. And again, they're prairie pothole ducks for breeding. Come through here uh, this spring and fall. Okay, the river is still waterfall habitat. What do we have here is our little primer. We got our canvas backs flying, big heads, sloping heads, big bills. Okay, we have our redheads down here, the red head and the grayish body, no big sloping bills. We have a mallard, what's it doing there? Dabbling duck. This is the mark through the chest of the ring bill duck. And let's see, that's a scop, blue bill. That's a scop right here, the lesser scop with uh, white sides. Uh, let's see, anything else? I think I think these are a little female scops probably. I don't think they're ruddy ducks. They don't look like they have a, ruddy duck has a flat wide bill. And these don't have those. So <clears throat> I guess that's what we have there. But I mean, again, you can, you can pick them up. I mean, it just takes a little bit of work. And if you want to start getting a little bit of work, you can come on an Audubon field trip. So let's see. Where's my note here, real quick? Oh, here we go. Thursday, or, uh, March, Sunday. Yeah, Sunday, March 14th, we're going to go to up the Mississippi River to just south of Savannah. Uh, we'll meet at Brothers Restaurant at seven o'clock in Rapid City. Uh, normally we would carpool up, but with COVID, we're asking people to drive their individual cars. Obviously, you get to choose who rides with you, but we're not pushing carpooling. Um, it's considered an all day field trip. We'll probably get done around one or so. You can peel off whenever you feel comfortable though. Um, we will have binoculars. We will have spotting scopes. Uh, we'll have field guides and anyone is welcome to come and there is no charge. On then also in April, this is a Saturday field trip on April 10th, we're going to go to Cone Marsh, which is south of Muscatine. It's a really normally very good uh, wetland for, see that we'll do the divers, the diving ducks will be doing in March because they're coming through now. The puddle ducks come through a little bit later. So we'll be doing puddle ducks, uh, potential shorebirds, as well as uh, spring pat spring migrating birds, birds. And we meet at uh, Marquette Street boat landing at seven o'clock for that on Saturday, April 10th. Again, these field trips are on our webpage, quadcityaudubon.org, so you can find them at your leisure. Um, we also have monthly meetings and apparently COVID is considered to be um, in abeyance enough that we can have them again. Uh, you will be required to wear masks. You will be required to be social distances within the room. Those are the second Thursday of each month in the Butterworth Center. 
I know that Thursday, uh, March 11th, is a program uh, on food resources of Lesser Scott. And then Thursday, April 8th, was to be Bob Bryant, uh, <clears throat> probably on vegetation around of the area, but I've heard he's not feeling very well. So that's probably going to be someone else. But at any rate, Butterworth Center, 7 o'clock, second Thursday of the month, March, April, May. We won't be meeting in June or July or August, but People are welcome to attend those free of charge. Uh, you don't have to be a member. So, I don't know, questions. If people can hear me, I'm ready to answer questions. If there might be any. So we have one question that was sure. um, posted earlier in the chat and I wanna encourage anybody who has a question, feel free to um, write it in the chat box at the bottom, or you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, the first question that we have from Lisa is, why is it that there are two groups of Canada geese, migratory and those that stay around? That's a good, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer. My guess is that there's probably, there probably is some sort of uh, genetic difference in this, in the populations, but I, I do not know that, you know, certainly I don't know that. It, it would make some sense that, uh, you know, people were breeding Canada geese when the populations were low, and it's very possible that they inadvertently selected for uh, birds that were more tame. But I, I don't know the answer. I'm just kind of, that's conjecture. All right, and do we have any more questions? If not, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. Um, I first want to thank Tim for doing this for us. This was super informative um, and it's gotten me really excited about going out and looking at some uh, geese and ducks and seeing what I can spot and name. So thank you a lot for being here tonight. Um, and I wanted to thank everybody for coming and I wanted to encourage um, everybody to go to the library's website and Facebook page and look over all of the events that we have posted. We have a couple of really cool ones coming up. Um, on Friday, we have one called Sheep to Sweater uh, and it's a, a hobby farmer tells us about how she raises her sheep harvest their wool and then uh, creates yarn from that and makes sweaters from that. So that's going to be really interesting. Um, and then next week we have our Illinois Humanities Road Scholar um, doing a program um, about uh, uh, quilts during the Civil War and um, uh, certain stitches and messages that were put in those quilts to um, help people navigate through the Underground Railroad. So that's going to be a really exciting one. Um, and then you can get on our website and see what else we have coming up. Um, we have a couple of kind words. Um, Susan says, thank you, great information. And Lisa said, thank you for doing this program tonight. Um, again, thank you everybody for coming. And I am going to go ahead and end things. Good night, everybody. Good night.